Hi, everyone, to another episode of It Depends Podcast. This one is very, very interesting because A, I get to hang out with my dear friend, Tony Beer, and uh, and all his wit. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, actually. Uh, the second thing is that we get to talk about a, an annual pilgrimage that we make every year to go see Oracle at its user conference called Cloud World. Now it's called Cloud World. It used to be called Open World. And we've been actually doing this for many years. And this year, uh, we came back with some some pretty uh, groundbreaking findings and uh, announcements that happened. So we get to parse and see what was announced, what is the impact, what is the overall future of Oracle uh, from what where we sit uh, as an analyst. So Tony, as always, welcome to this episode of It Depends. Well, thanks for having me, Sanchi. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, Tony, by the way, I'm just curious uh, if you have a count of how many Oracle uh, user conferences have you been to in the past? Oh, my God. Uh, it's, <laughs> this is starting to look at, I'm starting to really examine some real decay of some real brain cells here. I think I've been going there for probably close to 15 years. I see. So I started in Oracle in early 90s. So I've been going to what was at that time called IOUW, International Oracle Users Week. And for 10 years, I spoke every year uh, at uh, both the US and European conference. It was called EOUG, European Oracle Users Group. And it used to be independent actually in the 90s. And then Oracle said, that's it, we are taking over. And so there was some drama and then now now it's what it is so. i remember that yep <laughs> yeah it, it made for good headlines in the 90s <clears throat> yes uh yeah those were in fact uh since you're talking about oracle those were the days of the wit clause where oracle did not want to participate in uh, yes. benchmarks uh, uh tpc uh, benchmarks so th those mm -hmm. are some interesting days. But anyway, fast forward to 2024. So we're no longer in 1990s. Uh, I <laughs> want to ask you, uh, I've actually created a schematic diagram, which I'm going to share in just sure. a few minutes. But before we actually go into each and every announcement in the data space, what was your overall takeaway, uh, maybe from some of the keynotes you attended, from Larry Lesson's keynote? Uh, and others, Safras, uh, and uh, your just uh, pulse of the conference? Well, put it this way, I would say, and a lot of this is due to, you know, Oracle changing its release cycle of its of its, of its uh, databases, which used to be basically coincide with Cloud World. And now it tends to be, since they've got an annual cycle, that cadence tends to happen earlier in the spring. So basically at Cloud World, it's typically not about new product, but it's more about strategic direction of the company. And to me, it was just, you know, hit me between the eyes on, that one, on this one was basically multi-cloud. Now, of course, last year at Cloud World, um, or, you know, Larry Ellison, Lori, you know, I should say Oracle announced that it was going native inside Azure. And that capped basically a five-year process of getting closer and closer with Azure mm -hmm. Cloud. And quite an interesting process, two hyperscales literally getting to know each other. Um, pretty unprecedented in the industry. Um, and Larry, last year, a year ago, you know, Cloud World 2023, he said, watch this space. There'll be some other agreements and, you know, some other ones happening. So the great debate was, which one was it going to be? And it turns out it was both of them, you know, basically Google. And now the, the big surprise at, you know, at Cloud World, you know, uh, this year, just a few weeks, you know, uh, just a couple of weeks back was AWS. And so that got a lot of us having to change our diapers. <laughs> I like the way you put it. Uh, I, yeah, from my point of view, I, uh, I'm i always amazed at how sharp Larry Lesson is. And this year he turned um, 80. Uh, and oh, gosh, yes. Yeah, and he just looks amazing. He had a t-shirt with La Lanai, the island he lives on. I, I believe he owns the island of Lanai in Hawaii. Right. And um, and uh, to see him and the CEO of AWS on stage together mm -hmm. 
is something I'd never imagined I would see. So uh, uh, that week we were there. This was only about two weeks ago. We are yeah. recording this in September of 2024. So two weeks ago we were in Vegas. Uh, interestingly, that week uh, with all the announcements, Oracle stock just took off. And uh, and Larry Ellison uh, overtook Jeff Bezos uh, as being the second richest person in the world. Mm -hmm. He uh, just right behind Elon Musk. Right. So that may have changed by now, uh, but I think Oracle stock got a 20% bump. And the biggest news was, of course, what you just said. It was this AWS partnership. So, so I have this schematic here. And uh, I'm going to go through each area one by one. So I only focused on this. What is the AWS? And then before that, uh, earlier in 2024, Oracle announced their partnership with Google Cloud. W what does it mean? Uh, what is it? Well, put it this way. I think the best way to describe this is looking at this as has, this is, has evolved. Because I think Oracle, for the most part, is trying to replicate Basically, the you know the the template that it, that it took basically five years to establish with Azure, hmm. um, and with Azure, basically it started with an interconnect, which was announced literally five years ago, and pretty much this caught you know pretty much all of us by you know by surprise at that point. Um, but on the other hand, we afterwards we kind of thought, well, you know, something it's kind of like Oracle and Microsoft have not been considered to be like, you know, uh, heavy competitors for at least about 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so essentially it was kind of, we sort of took that as basically being the enemy of the enemy is thy friend as basically a Oracle at that time and Microsoft and Azure at that time. And um, we're, you know, consider that Amazon, AWS was their chief adversaries. And the, the, the deal there though, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, of basically power politics. It's a matter of that, they both have a lot of joint customers and a lot of Oracle customers said, you know something, we'd like to use Power BI. Hmm. Um, it was basically that, which, I mean, I originally thought it was Office 365, but I found it was really Power BI that was initially the killer app that brought them together with this high-speed interconnect that would basically put these data, you know, the, these two clouds on a high-speed connect that makes it, you know, um, it was like literally being almost the next best thing to being there, literally. Um uh, with the idea of that you'll get you know pretty decent response. You won't have to deal with these latencies with VNets or anything like that. And guess what? No data egress charges. We're going to operate these. You know, no, you can have an Oracle database, no CI, and Power BI or whatever other tools using in, in Microsoft, you know, in Azure, and they'll look like local tools, and you won't have to pay to the ferry data back and forth. So that's what really what started this whole thing. Uh, and then it evolved about three years later to where Oracle. And Azure, you know, Microsoft basically let's let's step this up now that we've gotten used to interoperating with each other. Because remember, this is two different clouds, two different control planes, harmonizing them. Yeah, I mean that's that's not a trivial feat. Um, and but anyway, so at that point, uh, the refinement was that you could now operate Oracle databases in OCI, but they can look like a near like an Azure service and manage from the Azure console. Um, and also, basically, uh, you know, you can acquire it, you know, you know, through Azure Marketplace, that type of thing. Even though, even though, basically, the database, which in this case we're we're, we're talking about now, is Exadata or Autonomous Database, which runs off Exadata. We're not talking about base database here. Um, that that's what that this agreement, you know, um, applied to. Now, there's a separate thing with base database, but I don't want to confuse the issue at the moment. So that was basically step two. Step three, which is a year ago at Cloud World 2023, they said, guess what? We've been doing so well with, with Microsoft, with Azure, you know, you know, our joint customers. We now have 500 joint customers. Mm -hmm. Let's now go in. Let's now let's go native. And so now there's an additional option. We're now an OCI data center or an OCI infrastructure, so to say, will be plopped inside an Azure, literally inside an Azure data center. And so now, I mean, that really completed the circle. Now, one other thing before we you know, go back into the others that we talk about the interconnects, you got to keep in mind, in most cases, the way cloud data centers are situated, they tend to be located in the same area, like the same office park in Reston, Virginia, yeah. or something like that. Correct. And so in most cases, these interconnects travel maybe like a mile or two or a few hundred feet. So 
But but basically, so this was really evolutionary process. So that's essentially what Oracle completed with Microsoft as of last year. Now, in terms of all the service integrations, and I'm not fully up on all this. I know there are various things like with key management that are still, you, you still can't use Microsoft Azure key management yet with Oracle. There's a bunch of stuff that's still, you know, you know, in the works, but the major piece of falling in place. Since that time back in, I guess it was um, July, um, Oracle announced a similar agreement with Google, which basically included all those three elements that it took Oracle and Microsoft five years to build. Now, it's not because Microsoft was not a great partner. It's that Oracle and Microsoft had to learn how to do this. Yes. And based on that, Oracle felt and Google felt confident enough that we could now do the whole thing in one fell swoop. Hmm. And so they announced it in July and they have four data centers live um, yeah. now. They, they just announced it at Cloud World and I believe either 11 or 12 um, you know, regions where the interconnect is. So that's what they announced with Google. So that stuff now is already happening. Yeah. The bomb drop, of course, was, and this was announced like right when we were in our analyst summit, I think the day before. Um, oh, now it's going to be AWS and then you know, basically um, uh, you know, you know you know, uh, you know, the CEO of, of of AWS goes on stage with Larry. Now, the AWS relationship at this point is still an announcement. There'll be yeah. a preview by year end. I think you have a little more exact information. I didn't know how many days since right. you basically said it was one data center. So still need to double check that. But essentially, it's at a much earlier stage. What's yeah. interesting with AWS is they went straight to let's go inside AWS. Yeah. They didn't announce anything about the internet connect. So my take my takeaway from that is that the real value add is being inside the data center, not the interconnect. The interconnect was essentially um, a, a stepping a, stone. Yeah. So that's in, in, in a very long nutshell. That's yeah. kind of my take on on the three different you know uh, agreements. So a so couple of things that, that I learned uh, about this is uh, Oracle was already available as a service. Uh, through RDS inside AWS, but that version of Oracle is just a standard edition. It does not have any of the new developments like vector search, uh, graph property graph, uh, JSON duality, all of these new things. So this new relationship called Oracle at AWS or Oracle at Google, or Oracle at Microsoft is for the Exadata autonomous database. So it has all right. the the newer uh, OCI native databases. Right. Okay. Let's kind of clarify that a little bit, which is that, yes, you're absolutely right. It's Exadata and Autonomous Database. Now, Autonomous Database runs on Exadata. So essentially, yes. they're two different. And Exadata has always run on unique hardware. It's originally Oracle's yes. engineered system. Engineered system, yes. I know, which, which, which software designed for the hardware. Um, and so that's so same pattern. And it makes sense because... Exadata is so highly optimized, and autonomous data you know, database even more so. Uh, they, you can't run it on foreign infrastructure. Oracle has to control that. Yeah. What's remarkable is that each of the hyperscales just are allow are admitting Oracle, and it's a privileged yeah. guest inside. The only other one that's gotten that status is yeah. NVIDIA with DGX Cloud. But the difference is NVIDIA does not run its own data, you know, its own data centers. Uh, but that, but also another clarification, you're talking about Oracle base database. Hmm. This agreement, as you said, does not cover Oracle base database because that can run as VMs on whatever infrastructure. You know, it's yeah. not hardware based, unlike let's say Exadata. Um, and Amazon has been offering Oracle on RDS for a bunch of years. And of course, Oracle about however, five or six or whatever number of years ago, Essentially jacked up the licenses, so you, they roughly doubled the cost of licensing yes. Oracle on already, uh, you know, on RDS to really make it was really part of a play, you know, on Oracle's part. Say like, you want to run Oracle databases, do it in OCI. It yeah. was a, bit, you know, it was part of Oracle's earlier vision that was very OCI centered and was not multi-cloud at all. So and, and um, now, so basically. RDS on on um, Oracle uh, da base database and RDS is not changed as of this. No nothing changes there. Also, as I understand it, oh, actually, in Azure you can also get something equivalent. I'm not sure what the licensing deal is there. I would presume it's similar, but I don't know. But that was that's also you can also get Oracle based database. I don't know about Google Cloud, but anyway, that's that's separate to all this. But yeah. My sense on all this is that I think you know, they, you know the you know the hyperscales see where the where the money is, and it's basically it's it's basically handling these exadata services. Yeah, 
And, uh, and so, so let's move on. So basically your point is that the license fee for this new offering is exactly the same, whether you get OC, uh, autonomous database inside OCI or inside AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, it's the same price, unlike yes. RDS, which was twice. Now RDS is is separate case and that's, yeah. And yeah. that's just that's more by you know by what's been going on before right. knows what's happening in the future. But no, what's remarkable yeah. is that Oracle has negotiated with three different hyperscalers yeah. and, their- and some Japanese ones here too. Uh, you can see Fujitsu NTT data uh yeah. and all right. So so uh, and who knows? Same thing, same thing. You know, yeah. and the thing is that to me leads to I think another point, which is really more about I think Larry Ellison's flexibility. Yeah. Or adaptability is probably the better way. So I don't flex adaptability. Yeah. Which is, Larry is, you know, against something until he's for it, and that doesn't that's that's doesn't mean he's wishy washy. Wishy washy is the last term I would use to describe Larry Ellison. It's more like when he recognizes yeah. that a different course is the better course, he will not cling. He will not stubbornly cling to the old way. He will basically ditch it and say let's go let's go the right direction yeah. i have to give so i have to give him like huge credit for basically doing things that were essentially counter to what he to what he what he believed in years ago and multi-cloud yeah. is a really great example of that yeah. and also uh to mention uh oci uh cost is also lower than other hyperscalers and it's also OCI is quite popular with uh, for AI model training, OpenAI, yeah. uh, and uh, NVIDIA. They're all customers and partners of Oracle. So well, it's interesting there because I think Oracle in this case, and this is I think I mean they've really they've been very lucky here, lucky and smart. But I, but luck also plays a part of this, which is that they were kind of I mean Oracle like others like you know. Uh, uh, the, a lot of the classic folks, except for Microsoft, yeah. were kind of caught, you know, kind of like, you know, like, you know, deer staring in, in headlights yeah. when, you know, AWS really started to really take off. And a lot of them really didn't see cloud as being, you know, they thought, oh, it's just host. You know, so, it's like. So yeah. let's, so Tony, um, uh, this is the biggest piece of, uh, but we have a lot of uh, areas to cover. So let's go sure. to. Uh, what was Oracle's strength before they even got into the cloud was on-premises? So they have still a very strong private cloud offering. Uh, yes. For because Oracle customers tend to be very large enterprises that right. may, for regulatory or some other reason, don't want to go to the cloud. So here I've mentioned three things here: dedicated region and customer. What exactly is that? Okay, well, we'll put it this way. There are several things. There, there are several forms of Oracle Hybrid Cloud. There's cloud at customer, which is basically a, you know a, a a an application specific or service specific. So it's like there's ex- exadata cloud at customer, hmm. and then you have some of their other you know you know cloud customers, which are individual services. Dedicated region is all the services that OCI offers that are at the cl- that are a cu- customer. Hmm. And what's really, and what kind of also blew my mind, you know, at Cloud World was that Oracle's figured out how to, and this gets to Gen 2 Cloud, how to both scale down and scale up. Hmm. The scale yeah. down yeah. is a small now dedicated region at customer, which hosts yeah. as a, everything that OCI, every service that OCI offers um, can go as small as three racks. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Th- um, that is quite amazing because last year uh, to get a dedicated region inside customers data center, it ha- it was I believe twenty five racks. Right. And this year it's down to three racks. Yeah, that's mind blowing. On yeah. the other hand, at the other end of the scale, just getting out, and so yeah, so that's their that's their hybrid play. But the but what's kind of interesting about OCI was leading up to before is that you know, with with luck and and timing and smarts is that they learned from, you know, I mean, they came in later and learned from the lessons that the hyperscalers learned. So they could design basically a very optimized and very flat topology. Um, And they could use things like RDMA, which is essentially basically, you're going directly to cash. You know, you don't have to go to the operating system. RDMA stands for? Remote, oh golly. um, uh, Remote uh, direct memory access. 
I believe. Yep, remote data memory access. Data memory. And then mm -hmm. there's also Rocky, which they're very well known for, ROCE, which is RDMA on converged Ethernet. Exactly, as a subset of, of yeah, RDMA. For the networking. Uh, right. Subset. So they so they have this very flat infrastructure that scales incredibly from three to you have these, you know, NVIDIA super clusters. I forget the number, like it's like I think like how many thousands of nodes of 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 G of Blackwells or GPUs. I yeah, think. so so Oracle announced an AI supercomputer with one hundred and thirty one thousand NVIDIA GPUs. Oh yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> AI yeah. supercomputer. Yeah, and, and, and it's because OCI is so, so flat and scalable, it can handle it. I don't think any of the other hyperscales have been able to yeah. really to match yeah. that. Yeah. But that's just incredible. And, yeah. and that's the thing is they, that, that was the other point I was trying to make before in terms of that they benefited from learning the lessons, but they also entered early enough to, you know, to basically get in there. And by the way, they were pretty you know, exacting in terms of OCI, you know, Gen 1, Larry basically said, no, nah, this is not going to cut it. We need to really, you know, to, we really need to basically, you know, go a step ahead. So they were willing to eat their own, you know, eat their own offspring and go to Gen two, um, and that's really been that's I think really been the secret, you know, to their success. Yeah. So so this uh, uh, point about uh, what you raised about how they shrunk uh, the size of uh, OCI cluster uh, to just three nodes, uh, three racks. Um, so that is a, is a theme which we will see uh, in the next point. Uh, and but before we go to the next point, I just want to mention for those who are watching this and wondering what is a alloy cloud. Alloy is actually uh, Oracle's branded like it's an OEM uh, yeah. version which companies can buy and uh, white label it. Uh, and then Sovereign Cloud is the same OCI, but it's air-gapped for the like, government or uh, agencies that don't want uh, internet access. But the most important thing here is this, uh, this philosophy of shrinking things, because I think Oracle is, has uh, realized that it rules the enterprise world, but then there are a lot of mid-sized, smaller uh, customers and that takes us to this next announcement, which is Excess Scale. Mm -hmm. uh, can you walk us through Excess Scale? Yeah, and I'm, I'm a little. Uh, my memory is a little hazy on it, but it's essentially a you know, a, you know, it's basically um, exit data at almost any you know, without having to go through t-shirt sizes. That's probably like the, the short of it. It's yeah. also say multi scan, you know, multi tenant, multi scale that too. Yeah. <laughs> but it's essentially what they've done is they've deconstructed, you know, exadata. You know, they really they, what they've done is like let's really th rethink exadata, you know, in basically a very cloud native form. I mean, exadata already abstracted data, you know, and, and compute, so that was not the issue. This is more like okay, now let's really look at the elastic side of this and how can we really blow this you know, blow this out? And the fact is that one of the things with exadata when it was you know on premise systems is you need to sell something that was like a certain size to really make it worth it to go that degree. Yeah. Of and the cloud that removes all those, all those limitations. So you can go as big or as small as you want. And that's really what access scale is all about. Yeah. And especially, so, especially the lower entry right. level. Yes. So the, uh, the anecdotal information I have uh, is that access data entry price was minimum of 10,000 access yeah. scale entry price is just $300. And right. what Exascale is, is it's using Exadata hardware, but but unlike in the past where Exadata is always dedicated, right. to this, this is a, a pool of compute and storage nodes, which any customer can get. It's pay as you go. And uh, it's kind of serverless, not fully serverless, but yeah, basically... Yeah. Uh, it's it's it. Uh, so the difference would be if you are a large enterprise and you have very uh, heavy duty dashboard reporting, data warehouse kind of of requirements, then you get go with extra data. But if you have these workloads that are spiky in nature, you need some. You need very fast uh, scale, elastic scale of nodes, and then scale down. Then you go with excess scale, 
uh, and um, and it's uh, literally a uh, virtualized exadata. So the term virtualized exadata is, is is not something that uh, Oracle uses. It's just uh, my way of just explaining what exascale is. That's a good way of putting it. The other thing, also, um, uh, and, and which you know, my other impression also is that. It's look is it shows how like Oracle's engineering, you know, basically kind of cross fertilizes itself. Because if you look at let's say autonomous database, there's something similar at play there, which is that autonomous I mean, whereas X Data Cloud Service is dedicated single tenant, autonomous database is multi-tenant. And so if you think about I mean, obviously Exascale basically takes this uh, you know, a few steps, you know, a few steps further, but like it's very compatible. It's very consistent with what they've been doing with autonomous database, and I wouldn't be surprised if like to see this basically um, uh, uh, implemented you know with autonomous if it's not already. Um, you know, it, it, the idea is that Oracle basically you know has one of the most automated and optimized databases. Like now, let's you know make this really accessible to the wider market, yeah. and and through our cloud infrastructure, we can price it cheaply enough to be very competitive. Yep, perfect. Okay, so let's move on to. I, I think I would say this would be one of our favorite topics, Converse Database. <laughs> uh, this is, again, Oracle's philosophy. What is Converse Database? Well, number one, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because of how they branded the, the duality, but we'll get to that. Converge is basically the multimodal database. And from that standpoint, Oracle's not unique. We're seeing that as, as outside of you know, AWS. It's really become kind of a, a trend, um, which is that, we're seeing, for instance, we're going on a MongoDB call, I would say, and they're talking about they have vectors, but almost like every relational database has vectors. A lot of document databases have, have vectors. A lot, you know, a lot of wide column, you know, you know, you know, you know wide column databases have vectors. Probably the only ones that don't have it, as I understand, are probably you know key value stores. But, but anyway, the idea being is that you know you you, you can have a database that can that can expose data in you know in different ways. Now there are many different the idea is common, but there are many different ways to do it. And so, for instance, you know, in you know, with Cosmos DB and Azure, you have to declare which API you're using. And then you're kind of stuck. Okay, this data will be relational. That data will be graph. Converged database. They so they support basically, um, you know, besides relational, there's you know JSON document structures and 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 it can be read. You know, there's MongoDB compliant. You know, BSON. There's graph. Um, uh, there, there's there's vector, and the thing is that the idea here is it's a virtualized view. That data underneath is relational, but it's a testament to like how fast cloud infrastructure is, and how fast and basically how cheap you know really fast storage is. In other words, that basically that that NVMe has become pretty much the standard. You know, it's pretty much replaced you know you know you know, you know replaced disk. And of course, and 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 memory or DRAM, it'll always be more ex more expensive, but it's gotten a lot less expensive. And so we can uh, deploy a lot more of the stuff. So we can have it on top of of, of NVMe flash. We can have, you know, we can have memory. So like there's a lot of stuff that you can, and plus also then the very fast backplanes, which means that you know when we you know all this sort of data virtualization that used to be a real you know performance hog, it's like. In modern infrastructure, it's like you can just you, know, you can just manifest itself you know, data almost instantly. So that's really at the secret of all this. What what Oracle does under the covers is they have used GraphQL, which basically kind of you know, and GraphQL is the one that's kind of making all the connections. I mean, you're not have you don't have to be GraphQL you know developer or anything like that. But underneath the hood, there's GraphQL, which basically says, "I want this you know document view." GraphQL is mapping it you know to the columns and rows. It's, you know, did it with property graph, you know, and um, yeah. so, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's a little bit of a, probably a, a little bit of a, a different mechanism with vectors because that's a different type of data. But still, the idea is that we can really virtualize all this stuff and the infrastructure is fast enough to support it. Yeah. I, and that that API, the GraphQL API that goes, looks at the relation data and builds out the document, it is yeah. also MongoDB compatible. Right. Exa exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, which... Is nearly crucial when 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 Oracle first came out. It was actually, you know, pre you know prior to JSON duality. duality. Um, as I said, I love that term because it has psychological ramifications here. <laughs> um, but beyond that, or multiple personalities. Um, uh, but before it, it took Oracle a while. Initially, they had you know you know 
they didn't use another standard. And I kept saying, hey, guys, the world knows, you know, Bison, MongoDB, and they finally embraced that, you know, with a vengeance. Yeah. Good that, for that's them. great. Yeah, because, you know, when relational databases first started adopting uh, JSON documents, uh, yeah. they did it in a sort of uh, uh, a kind of brain dead way, which was yeah. we'll support the JSON document, but we'll store it as a blob. Which yes. means that if I have to update uh, one attribute, let's say, you know, I change somebody's address, I cannot uh, update a blob. I have to read the entire document, make a change and rewrite the blob. So it was a very uh, difficult way of doing it. But now uh, with uh, the way Oracle has figured out, this is actually a, a, a brilliant architecture where both the JSON document and the relation uh, model uh, first class citizens. Right, exactly. And not only that, you get all that great acid, you know, you yeah. get all your transactional consi you know, consistency. So I, I, I eventually update one element of a JSON document. And basically, if it repeats in other, you know, in other collections, it's like, that gets updated. <laughs> I yes. don't have to keep updating it in every single document where it's yes. manifested. Using the power of primary key and foreign key. Yes. So, so they've actually <laughs> literally collapsed these two worlds yeah. and just uh, made it seamless. So, and, and moving on to property graph, there's also a very interesting thing because Oracle, uh, as we know, uh, has had this uh, Oracle spatial and graph uh, offering for for very many, many years, sure. but it was kind of a standalone. It sort of sat on its own, but now the graph uh, primitives are also natively brought in. And I think the most interesting thing was the query language. Yes. Uh, SQL, PGQL, uh, PGQL. I, I always confuse, I confuse that. It's a really complicated one. Yeah, it's like, SQL, yeah. P, PG, PDQ, which stands PGQ. for- PGQ, I always kept saying PDQ pretty damn quick. <laughs> but yeah. it's PG, SQL, PGQ. Yeah, which is property graph query. So, right and yeah, that's it's, it, it's, it's a, that. Yeah, uh, ANSI ANSI standard extension to SQL uh, to support uh, graph uh, queries. Yeah. So and, uh, it's something that uh, Oracle was uh, one of the members of the committee, but so were other graph uh, databases yes. like Neo4j. So, yeah, yeah, it's been a big headline this summer because that the standard now is the is uh, I believe it's just been formally adopted and it really right. addressed what was i think the achilles heel of graph which was that graph is something which when it emerged as a database you know as a as a technology it was kind of hard to understand but when you look at use cases it's really intuitive i always thought of that relational is the way that data is structured and graph is the way that the world is structured because yeah. in reality the, the world is not i mean you know, tables, you know, basically tables with columns and rows do are you fit very well with say like financial data. But let's say, like when, a, when you're looking at your group of friends, you have your family, you've got then the data gang, you've got people, you know, and the vendors, you are a member, you are a member of many different social groups. You have many different sort of circles. You have many to many relationships. And yeah. that's what, and graph basically is, 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 is what, you know, is, what instantiates that. So if you explain the use case, Graph is very intuitive, but the problem was all these years, you just, you know, there was no, it, it, you didn't have anything equivalent of SQL. Um, there was no standard query, you know, query language. And so, you know, basically, you know, end users or customers had to learn different skills as a result. It really, it kept the, it, it kept the, you know, you know, that, that whole sector from, from growing, you know, it was just, it was. Yeah, but, you to learn standard yeah, Gremlin and uh, yeah. or Sparkle and RDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but so, the thing you put the standard in place, and now it's like SQL. You now have a common, you now have a common target, and now we can develop a common skills base. And guess what? With SQL, and and they engineered it so that you know even though uh, SQL PGQ is not the exact equivalent of GQL, which is the which is really the root of all this. Hmm. Um. It is compatible. Yeah. 
So, so yeah, so talking about uh, databases. Oh, by the way, sorry, we haven't talked uh, too much about vector search. So let me right. just mention. So uh, because AI is, is the hottest topic, yeah. and we are we we are neglecting AI. Sorry, AI. Uh, so this is the vector search is basically introduction of a new data type called vector data type. And uh, now Oracle uh, can uh, go to unstructured data, uh, read the like uh, chunk and embed that uh, unstructured data. Uh, right. Oracle introduced some uh, either uh, PL SQL store procedure that can uh, read unstructured data and mm -hmm. uh, it built in uh, LLMs or it can call external ones. Uh, it works with almost all the important ones. Uh, it can integrate with Bedrock, Vertex AI, yeah. uh, of course, all the models. Uh, well, that's then, basically all the multi-cloud relationships there because previously in OCI, you, you, I mean, even though you could yeah. with, with Oracle 23 AI, yeah. and select AI specifically, we can trigger this with a single yeah. query. Yeah. You can use any model. The only models that they see OCI you know, in its own cloud supported or made available with integration was, was from Cohere or, or Llama 3. But now you go into Google Cloud, you know, Azure, AWS, it just really opens the world up. Um, so yeah. that's, that's, you know, th that's the beauty of it. The other thing too is what it really supports is what I believe to be the killer app, at least in the short term for enterprise you know, you know, use of generative AI, uh, which is essentially we want we want to basically be able to you know you know do basically conversational queries, do summarization, but on our own data. We'll take foundation models that have already been trained, but we don't want to we don't want to target this at you know at you know at, 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 at internet data. We want to target this at our own data. Hmm. So I think RAG retrieval augmented generation. Right now, in the in the near term, will be the killer app for generative AI in the enterprise. But very nice, yeah. So so that's Oracle uh, makes that possible. So moving to the next set of announcements, we are going to talk about Oracle twenty three AI, which when general availability uh, every four years, Oracle comes out with uh, what they call or the industry calls long term support. And these are the databases that uh, companies can buy and they know that uh, they are guaranteed support on it for uh, for quite some time. Uh, I think two years ago, 21C came out, which was experimental or... Uh, yeah. I, it, it had some label on it, but now there is a new release. It has a lot of um, uh, enhancements uh, there are ways, like if two people are updating the same document, they have uh, figured out a way by which you are not uh, locking yeah. a table. So, so performance okay. improvements, reliability improvements, uh, when you shard the database across many nodes. So, the, uh, so you have a primary shard and secondary shards. So yeah. now if a shard goes down, how does it negotiate the consensus of uh, which one becomes primary is through raft. Right, right, uh, right. One thing that I found very interesting, by the way, you know how we are noticing that Oracle has these trends. One trend is to uh, is to downsize. Another trend that I found very interesting is Oracle has now realized that so much of functionality that used to exist in monolithic databases escaped. Right the atmosphere and went to the app apps or, or infrastructure, they're bringing it to the database, like nice. true cache. So they're saying, why why have a cache be sitting outside, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, when, uh, when the logical thing is to have the cache be as close as possible to the database, because then it reduces the round trip when there's a cache hit miss then you can easily, you know, and all that is being automated, by the way, Oracle. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then SQL firewall is the other thing Oracle is saying is like, why has these, this firewall sit outside? Right. Uh, uh, right. So why can we not uh, ensure that only authorized users are allowed to see? So, so this is the interesting thing. Yeah, we'll put it this way. It's part of this is consistent with what you know, Oracle's strategy over the years, which is to bring as much into the database as possible with the idea that 
um, if you can collapse the app tier into the database, you eliminate a lot of the, you know, a lot of the discontinuities, a lot of the complexity, and you gain most all, most importantly, you basically improve your security. Um, yeah. Because the thing is, a lot of the issue, a lot of the issues very often are okay. The database might be secure, but if you have an app that's not secure, hmm. and you know, it, it makes for it makes the database a lot more susceptible to things like SQL injection, you know, and, and denial of service attacks and all that sort of wonderful stuff or not so wonderful stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, that's you know, you know, the big picture is about that. Yeah. Um, drilling down. When you look at Wrapped and Lock Free, essentially Oracle is basically they've learned a lot of lessons that all the NoSQL databases on the cloud have, have taught us, which is that there are ways, uh, you know, especially with modern infrastructure that's high speed, that you can now do a lot of things. Okay, I mean, there still is the cap theorem; it's still there. It's it's not like it goes away, but we can really minimize it. But you know, you know, in other words, that if you're just changing one aspect of a record, don't you don't have to lock that entire record up, or you don't have to lock the entire table on, on what, I mean, like, and these are just, I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, now it's kind of elementary, but this stuff was like really revolutionary a, a decade ago when, you know, and, and the thing is that, you know, in, you know, innovations like true cash, well, true cash was an answer to, well, <laughs> to basically the fact that in the past databases were, you know, were very bulky to update. And so you needed an external caching layer to keep that website going. And yeah. now part of this is that, as I said, one is that, you know, the backplanes have gotten really fast, but two, also memory's gotten a lot cheaper. It's the same thing that makes a lot of these other wonderful yeah. things possible. And so that's, that's, you know, that's true cash. So, I mean, yeah, man. And the other thing with, you know, with, with automatic, you know, query plan management is again, it's like, it's applying machine learning to kind of, fit, you know, figure out what's going on there. And by the way, if this new plan, you know, basically is going south, We'll, we'll we'll automatically put back the better plan. Um, yeah. So it's taking a lot of things that it's taking advantage of, of a lot of innovations that have happened over the last decade, and they're really taking it to heart. You know, in twenty three yeah. AM. So yeah, this is uh, auto auto plan management. You know, takes a look at how a query ran in the past. Uh, right. So it's kind of monitoring uh, queries yeah. and then automatically. Uh, fixing it. So talking about uh, automatic updates, uh, the uh, another hot database at Oracle is uh, Heatwave, and mm. so so that that's no pun heat... intended. I'm sorry, no pun no intended. pun intended. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> very true. So uh, so Tony, the funny thing is, I uh, I'm also writing a blog like you are on uh, findings and. Mm -hmm. In that process, I spent some time uh, going through Oracle's website uh, and looking at the documentation. I was actually quite surprised to see that under Oracle databases, you not only have 23 AI, Heatwave, uh, but you still have NoSQL. And yeah. NoSQL had released notes called 24.1. Yeah, so, yeah. There's a, so I was like, wait, NoSQL is being kept up to date. Then there's a big data. Uh, remember, I think they had the partnership with Cloudera. Long yeah, ago. yeah, Hortonworks Cloudera. Yeah. Yes, Hortonworks first, then Cloud. That is yeah. still active. Then uh, I saw Times Ten. Uh, also, you know, Mike Olson's company, Berkeley DB. Yeah. Uh, so all of those are there. I and we just uh, completely ignore some of these old uh, databases, but yeah. the two big ones. Uh, 23 AI and Heatwave. Yes. So let's talk about Heatwave. What is Heatwave? Okay, Heatwave. Uh, well, it's not about global warming, um, <laughs> except when it comes to database. No, it's essentially Oracle, you know, reimagining MySQL. Now, there's a certain parallel with you know with what let's say Google did with AlloyDB and and Amazon with Aurora with you know. No, it's it's like reimagining these open source databases, but it's did it with a very opposite approach. The others essentially said, let's gut the engine, we'll put our own engine in and just have the API. And Oracle said, no, look, let's just keep the, the core, core of this intact. You know, by the way, we own my MySQL. We don't want to ditch it. But but now because of, with, with all with, with all the lot of the um uh and you know all, all a lot of the innovations we've seen, you know, again with infrastructure, what I call is like Moore's law, the equivalent of Moore's law to the rest of Compute, you know, compute infrastructures includes storage and networks, um, and cloud. 
um, is that we can, you know, Oracle could basically, you know, uh, make MySQL a heck of a lot more extensible and actually, you know, add a column store to it. And nobody else offers MySQL as an analytic database. Um, and they've also, in, you know, they've also extended, you know, with, you know, with Lakehouse integration, and they've also done a lot of cool things with AutoML um, and the vec and vector storage with Generate. I, I think my, my general comment on this is that Oracle has had a lot of what I would call skunkworks projects in the past. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned a bunch of these databases that still survive. They probably have limited, you know, you know, install bases, and you know, good for Oracle that they are basically keeping those. They're keeping those, you know, they're keeping those alive. They're not orphaning. But Heatwave is really unusual in terms of this is a skunkworks project that really is caught is caught fire, and I think and and, and you know we've had some debates with some of our colleagues who think that basically that when Oracle sees Heatwave as, as as a threat to to the mothership that they're going to mm -hmm. ditch, but like I think you and I would vote very vociferously disagree with it. Yeah. It's basically reaching a large audience that Oracle never knew how to reach for. They own MySQL, but yet everybody else you know, owned the MySQL audience. <laughs> Yeah, and the fact is, what they realized was they couldn't just do a better MySQL. They had to really rethink it, and that's what Heatwave was all about. And the other thing that's interesting is that even though it looks like they've done a lot of similar things with the mothership in terms of you know you know generative AI and AutoML, they've done it themselves. They have not they've not downsized exadata, you know, to fit Heatwave. It's like they've done it in a way they basically. You know, they're, they're going the same goal, but they're doing it in a way that's basically designed for the platform as opposed to being bolted onto the platform. So I think those are my couple of my questions. I, mean, I think that's yeah. remarkable. And, and it's got, got some traction. Right. You know, if you're a Silicon Valley company, a startup, there's no way you're going to go for an Oracle database. It's just, right. you know, but Heatwave could be a, a, a really good starting point. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. And what uh, the first thing that really amused me was all this uh, last few years that Oracle has been on the journey, we always knew it as MySQL Heatwave. And then Oracle all of a sudden said, no, wait, this has become bigger than MySQL. So MySQL is a component. So they dropped from the branding, the word MySQL is just called Heatwave. But it's got the operation database from MySQL. It's got uh, it's an HTAP database, so it's got transaction and analytical. It supports yes. uh, uh, both uh, tables that are in MySQL and files that are in object store. So that's where they have the the lake house. Uh, they also have built-in LLMs. Uh, they have a vector store that they build. So it's actually a Pretty full-fledged uh, ecosystem that has developed uh, inside Heatwave. Right, right. No, it's 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 pretty impressive. As I said, it's as I said, it's a Skunkworks project that is actually real. It's probably I think Oracle's most successful Skunkworks project. And um, as you say, it's basically reaching out to an audience that was not going to go for it. It's yeah. a that was not going to go for Oracle database. They once, I mean, MySQL remember was designed. You know, was intended initially to be. A very simple database was the old lamp stack, and so this basically is kind of you know, and 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 over that or last about twenty years, it MySQL has built a very large skills base out there. So Oracle saying, let's we can hit that, you know, we can you know reach that skills base, and by the way, we're going to do we're going to blow this thing out of the water and and make it into something more than what they can get anywhere else. In other words, it's not just a better MySQL. So that's uh, yeah. that's what I think what's remarkable about it. Yeah. So, you know, some people may not know all the history. Uh, some of the newer folks, uh, you yeah. mentioned LAMP stack. Do you remember? <laughs> Can you elaborate? Yes. What is LAMP? Linux. Okay. I'm Linux. Apache. Apache. Yes. Apache yeah. web server. Um, MySQL. MySQL. And, and then Perler Python. Yeah. P was for PHP Python. Right, and right. MySQL, for those uh, who uh, may not know, uh, was a hugely popular open source, which Sun That's... Microsystems bought, and then Oracle bought Sun Microsystems, right. and then uh, ended up owning MySQL. For the longest time, it was put in the cold storage. We had no idea That's... where it was going, and then MySQL just took off. So, well, what you say, MySQL took off or Heatwave took oh, off? Heatwave took off. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thanks. Yes. yes. yes.
Yeah. I mean, well, oh, the other thing they just took off is that, you know, they actually, I mean, they did this, as I said, it's a classic Skunk Works project. And, yeah. and I think it impressed enough folks out there that it really made, you know, it really yeah. made it its own. Uh, yeah. So that takes us to the, to the last uh, area. And in fact, uh, this is the, the last thing we're going to talk about, Intelligent Data Lake. Uh, initially, I, I, I thought AI should be a bubble by itself because there's so much going on in AI. Yeah. Uh, security is huge for Oracle. There's so many areas. There's also the whole ERP side, which is a fusion. But let's talk about intelligent data lake and what what it is, or how little we know about this actually. Really, more how little we know about it, because basically, it was, <laughs> it was really surprising. You just announced this, and uh, I think it's just something which kind of fell, you know, between the cracks at, at Cloud World. But essentially, Oracle is is going full bore. Um, on supporting um, Iceberg, which really has become, you know, the de facto standard for open for open yeah. table formats. And just a, a, a little bit of just to kind of recap on that, which is that the open table format is essentially putting a relational database structure, an asset compliant relational database metadata structure atop data set that's basically in probably part, usually it will be Parquet files. It yeah. could be some others, but Parquet has become the de facto standard format that sits in cloud object storage, which is more than likely to be Amazon S3 compatible API. Um, so it's basically taking advantage of the fact that these, there's this all this commodity, this data is sitting in commo you know, commodity, you know, object storage out there. And wouldn't it be nice, you know, which we call the data lake, wouldn't it be nice to have, to me, the, you know, the whole elevator pitch about it is about having acid. In other words, and what it really means is that it's having confidence in the data that you're getting. It's not corrupted. It's current. It's consistent. Um, and then there are other number of other cool things that come with that because when you put this table structure in, um, you can then do much more granular security. You can do much. You, know, you can do much more. You know, better indexing. You do much faster performance. Um, and it's not by changing anything physical. It's a metadata layer, and that's been the beauty of all this. And the reason why. The, the lake house the, the open table format has taken off is because well in of itself it's not something where one vendor is going to differentiate from the other as basically databricks has, has, has learned and is adapted to rather an interesting way um but uh but on the other hand it's something which actually is really a win-win for you know for any vendor that's you know that's basically trying to uh, you know access cloud object storage we're still in early days with you know with, with yeah. the lake house because one of the nice things about the lake house, you know, is especially with iceberg as everybody supports it. One of the one of the disadvantages of the lake house is that everybody supports it because if I have let's say Oracle data or, or if I'm Oracle and I want to go into data that's been put in, that's been you know put in by um uh, by Snowflake, that's in format that I can read. Who's governing it? And so I think there are a lot of issues in terms of the multi, in terms of using it multi vendor. But I think in the short term, what this is going to do is it provides a, a you know a standard which against they can all you know target. And that's as I understand it, that's what intelligent data lake is all yeah. about. They don't call it lake house for some odd reason. But I think you and I will both admit we need to get briefed in more detail about you know right. what Oracle how this is going to be right. And, and interestingly, the way uh, Oracle is thinking through this is that there is an intelligent data lake that's part of the, for the regular data, but then there's an extension into the fusion middleware, which yeah. includes all of Oracle's ERP, right. APM, uh, all, all of the uh, CRM, uh, the application suite uh, yeah. of products. And so yes. they're sort of like uh, an amalgamated lake house of uh, of data. Uh, they also announced uh, 50 AI agents, uh, all again on top of Fusion, that allow uh, you to automate uh, a lot of right. business processes. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, put it this way, as I said, I think we need to get, I, I can't really speak more in depth about this at this point, because we really have not been properly briefed yeah. yet. But what it really is doing is it's opening up the crown jewels. Um, and I think this is going to be a continuous story. And I think once we have that, then I think it would be very interesting to talk about it. it keep in mind the fact that this is not occurring in a vacuum because, of course, SAP has Datasphere, which is their data fabric, which goes atop their data warehouse, 
which you know their cloud data warehouse, which in turn basically you know you know has ready access to right. um, to basically eighty percent of the world's you know you know you know you know, you know ERP transaction data or something like that. I, I, there's some sort of or there's some sort of stat out there, but it, it's certainly Oracle. Con- you know, my sense is that uh, that it's Oracle um, essentially putting in it's um, it, it's it's definitely basically a, a a foot in the door for Oracle to really tap you know, the family jewels with its, which is with its um, application. And keep in mind, there's one other little interesting fun mm-hmm. fact that, you know, that Fusion Apps, you know, the, the Fusion Apps SaaS service is moving a top autonomous database. Oh, wow. And that also opens very interesting okay. possibilities. Um, in my, in my, uh, po- in, in, in my report, and I'm right now still in draft form, I kind of speculate about this, that, you know, with, with Fusion Apps going on to autonomous database, at some point I could see Fusion Apps at Azure, Fusion Apps at AWS, oh, Fusion wow. Apps at Google Cloud. It could yeah. be kind of interesting. Yeah, I am actually very uh, interested in seeing how will the entire ERP area get disrupted by agents. Like, could I have? That's a whole other. That that's a, that's a whole. Other, uh, whole yeah. Other so we this there. still early days, but I I think it's moving uh, at uh, such a rapid clip that ho- yeah was next year. Uh, before we end, actually, I also want to mention since we are talking about uh, the fusion uh, part, when we were in Vegas that uh, two weeks ago, there was the Oracle Cloud World we attended, but adjacent to that was the Sweet World, which sure. is the Net Suite. And mm-hmm. although yeah. I don't cover that space much, but I did hear that Oracle announced uh, a partnership uh, or some sort of integration with Salesforce. So yeah. NetSuite yeah. and Salesforce are, are, are competitors, but even they, so so this is a new Oracle we are witnessing. Where In they're the world. Signing a partnership with everybody, you know? It's the, it's the new world. I mean, I was having discussions with IBM earlier today about like their partnership with AWS. Hmm. You know, we're, we're seeing so many, so many likes, you know, which are supposed to be like, you know, repelling the yeah. track. And, and the reason for it is that customers are basically forcing the issue. I mean, I mean, given basically all the, all the trash talk that basically AWS and Oracle used to aim at each other. In fact, they had the two CEOs in that stage. So There's only one reason for that is because their customers demanded it. Yeah, very true. Uh, Tony, it's been absolutely fabulous. Uh, nice. I think we covered a lot of ground. Thank you so much for bringing your wisdom and your years and years of knowledge covering Oracle and everybody else to this. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for for sharing your thoughts. It's been my pleasure, Sanjeev. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye. Next time. See you. Bye-bye.